welcome to the Town of Essex Select Board meeting for June 17th, 2019. And please join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Evan, are there any agenda additions or changes this evening? No, no additions or changes. Okay, then we can move on to item four, public to be heard. This section of the agenda is for anyone who wants to speak about something that is not already on the agenda. If you have something you'd like to speak about that's not on the agenda, Margaret Smith, I see you in the audience, please come to the microphone. Is there anyone else who'd like to speak about something that is not currently on the agenda? All right, we're going to move on. Our first order of business is the first class liquor license approval for Suko Thai. Mr. Lee, would you like to come on, or excuse me, are we ready to discuss that first? Uh, yeah, we're going to see if there's any issues with it. Okay. You have the uh, application in your packet. Do you have Max? Yeah, on page three of the application under the, uh, the education seminar, it has listed in the document 5.14.19, but the uh, accompanying um, information showing the certificate says it's actually 6.5.19. So it's a minor change, but I think we should correct that. Okay. We can correct that? Yep. Just Otherwise, that was good. Does anybody else have any questions or concerns about the application for Sukhothai? Okay. And hearing none, um, Andy, you are generally our mover <laughs> on these issues. I move the select board approve first class liquor license for Dian Li doing business as Sukhothai. I second that. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Mr. Lee, you're all set, but I just want to give you an admonition that we generally give all of our establishments in the community that apply for a liquor license. The select board takes the issuance of liquor licenses very seriously, as should the area establishments who serve alcohol. <laughs> we expect you not to serve alcohol to minors, nor to anyone who is obviously inebri inebriated. We thank you for doing business in Essex and we wish you the best. Would you like to take a moment to go to the microphone and just tell us about your restaurant and uh, any pertinent information since you're a new establishment? Thank you very much for being here this evening. Thanks. All right. Our next item of business in the packet, you will note that we have a list of volunteers and multiple committees who are um, up for reappointment. So we have the Cemetery Commission, Cons Conservation and Trails Committee, 
Zoning Board of Adjustment, Economic Development Commission, Planning Commission, Energy Committee, and Library Board of Trustees. Are there any candidates for these positions in the audience this evening? I see Tom from the Planning Commission. Okay. What I'd like to do is, um, is it just the two of you? Anybody else? Hands for interviews for, and John? Okay. So one, two, three, we will discuss, you can come up and to the mic and talk to us about why you'd like to be reappointed to the board or your particular commission and the board members will be able to ask questions. And then after we have those conversations, later on in the meeting, the board will go into executive session to discuss appointments and we will come out of executive session at the end to make our votes and you will be notified by staff after that. So Tom, um, would you mind going to the microphone? Tom, how long have you served on the Planning Commission? Uh, I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps your chair knows. Several years. <laughs> Several years. <laughs> Eight years. That qualifies as. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions for Tom Furlan? So. Okay. And then, do you want to talk about the wrinkle? The wrinkle, yes. The wrinkle Let's talk about the wrinkle. I'm about to leave for a year. Um, so we have a proposal to let someone from this currently in the village um, plan commission to take my spot for that year. Okay. So we hope that you would consider that and approve that. So this would be to have somebody serve as an alternate to you. Right. So you would not be stepping down from the board commission, mm -hmm. but you would have someone serve in your place while you're away. Right. So for your terms that first year. And we understand from the chair of the commission that this is okay with you? Absolutely. Okay. We'll endorse this approach. Okay. And does anybody on the board have questions about how they'd like to handle this? No? Okay. Seems pretty straightforward. Yeah. I think having it thinking out, a little bit outside the box like this is great. I think the uh, cross-pollination from the village planning commission to the town is, uh, is a good thing. So <coughs> thinking about that. I think what I'd like to do before we move off of the Planning Commission, perhaps if we could invite John Alden to come up to the microphone as well. John <coughs> is the person being recommended to be Tom Furland's alternate on the Planning Commission for the Town of Essex. John, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and why you want to be an alternate on the Town <laughs> Planning Commission as well as serving on the Village Planning Commission? Um, hi, I'm John Alden. Um, I, I, this is on, an opportunity that's pretty interesting. I know there have been other public servants who have served both the town and the village, and I think it's, uh, we're all trying to, to see that happen and go forward, and it's a great thing. Um, I've sat in on many uh, town planning commission meetings over the last few years, and, and it's a great group of people that are doing their uh, public service there. Uh, I am on the village planning commission. I've been on that for somewhere around 10 years. I'm currently vice chair. Um, so I think it's a, it's, a, it's a very interesting opportunity. And I'm happy to uh, fill in on Tom's, uh, in Tom's absence if that's what the town uh, select board would like. And I'm uh, at your disposal. Thank you, John. Does anybody have any questions for John? Just one clarifying one. Um, were there any other applicants um, to the Planning Commission uh, that put their names forward, or was it just uh, just you, Tom, and with the alternate recommendation? Yeah. Just wondering if there's anyone who. Greg. We generally don't advertise the reappointments that are coming up, um, so it's never advertised as open, and we have okay. not had we've not heard of any other interest. Okay. Anybody else? All right, John, thank you. Tom, thank you. So we will take this into executive session at the end of the meeting, and you'll hear the exciting results <laughs> when we're done. Sir, you, I, I forgive me, I'm not remembering your name, but if you could please come to the mic and introduce yourself and the committee that you want to re be reappointed to. I do apologize for not remembering your name. That's okay. It's, uh, my name's uh, Phil March, and this is a... Uh I'm applying for the You look familiar. We just talked to you two or three weeks ago. That's right. So, <laughs> <laughs> and 
like to talk to me again. That's fine. Okay, so <laughs> you were applying for a vacancy on the Essex Energy Committee. I am. Committee. I am. Okay. I've uh, had a long interest in the committee, have sat in on multiple okay. meetings over the last year. Okay. And we have already interviewed you, and you have been very patient while we waited to get everybody in together and done in one fell swoop. So. Thank you. Thanks for your patience. Okay. Does anybody have any questions about our slate of appointments? Andy? Uh, just because I need to do it in an open meeting, I've disclosed that I have a potential conflict of interest. My wife is a library trustee. Right. Um, but I think I can be impartial in deciding whether or not she can continue in that role. So I will participate in the vote unless somebody on the board objects. I have no objection to that. I don't see anybody else has an objection. I, I trust that Andy is very straightforward and honest and upright as this is. Okay. So we will. Um, table these uh, nominations for reappointment for the moment and we'll pick them back up in executive session at the end of the evening. So thank you all for coming up and talking to us. And thank you for your service and being willing to volunteer for the town of Essex and for your long service, especially you, Tom and John. Thank you. All right. Our next item is the uh, energy plan, adopting the energy plan. Melanie Needle is here to discuss it with us. Melanie, do you? Oh, excellent. We have a mic right there. Hi, thank you for having me back to discuss the Essex Community Enhanced Energy Plan. Um, I'll just give you a, a two minute overview about. Sorry? Am I in the way? Can everybody see? Nope, you're not in my way. Um, so I was here, um, I think it was two, three weeks ago. I gave a presentation on um, the Essex Community Enhanced Energy Plan, so I'll just go over the highlights. Um, in 2016, uh, the Vermont Legislature adopted Act 174, which authorizes municipalities to adopt an enhanced energy plan. And what that does is it gives the municipality greater weight, greater say um, in the Public Utility uh, Commission's Section 248 state permitting process for renewable energy generation. Prior to Act 174, um, municipalities really weren't part of that process. And so what Act 174 says is if a municipality um, adheres to the Department of Public Services um, energy planning standards, then they have an enhanced energy plan. The Regional Planning Commission um, has the ability to make that determination. Um, and so this past year, um, I've been working with Essex Junction and the town to develop the Essex Community Enhanced Energy Plan. So it's an energy plan for both jurisdictions. Um, essentially what it does is it advances um, the Vermont energy goals related to um, obtaining 90% of energy from renewable energy sources, weatherizing buildings, so making them more energy efficient, improving the thermal envelope, um, also um, helping to transition the transportation sector from one that's powered by fossil fuels to one that's powered by electric vehicles, people using transit, walking and biking infrastructure, um, and then um, also just reducing energy as a whole, so I think the goal is about one third less energy by 2050. Um, all the numbers and you know milestones along the way towards these goals are in the plan. Um, so the Essex Community Energy Plan sets the the, the actions that um, both jurisdictions um, can um, take to um, make these goals happen. Um, so, and also land use is a big component of um, reducing energy, so focusing development in um, concentrated compact centers so that people are driving less and they can walk to, the, to work. Um, so, also the Essex Community Enhanced Energy Plan is part of um, the Village's draft comprehensive energy plan that is currently going through its public process. The Planning Commission um, 
approved and made a recommendation to the trustees. Um, so the trustees are um, considering it. Um, currently, they will have their first public hearing on July 23rd um, with final um, adoption of the comprehensive plan in August. And so their comprehensive plan will um, include this as an appendix. Um, currently, the town plan will not include this as an appendix. This will kind of, it'll be a standalone document until the town um, updates um, its town plan. Um, but that doesn't mean that um, there's no, there's not a use for this at, at this point. Um, so I could see the town using a, the siting policies that are in the plan to help them determine whether they want to support um, a developer who's looking for a preferred site status. Um, and so what that means is in the state net metering rule, a developer can be designated a preferred site and get an enhanced um, net metering benefit. But in state statute, there's not really a definition of what preferred sites are. And so I think that this plan does a really good job of identifying um, what the preferred site is. And so it's essentially, if a developer comes in and they adhere to the siting policies, then the town could consider writing a letter of support for that. So it makes that process kind of transparent in the interim. Um, also, the Regional Planning Commission has substantial deference. And many of the ECOS policies that we have in our, our the ECOS plan is the regional plan. So many of the policies that we have in the regional plan <coughs> do bring in the local constraints that are um, consistent with local land use policies in Essex. And so, um, you know, we will review, and we've successfully done that with a, an application already. I think it was the Sand Hill Road um, property. Um, and so we will review uh, any application with our ECOS um, Citing policies. So um, I think that is just kind of an overview. And does anybody have any questions? Thank you, Melanie. Does anyone have questions? I just have a comment that uh, I know there's a lot of important energy goals in there, and it's a, um, endorsed by the Energy Committee and the Planning Commission and the CCRPC who work real hard on uh, these kind of things in our behalf. And uh, I'm very pleased to, to see that this has um, been developed. It's an important uh, issue that we need to tackle. It's a, not just a town issue. It's not just a regional issue. I mean, it's a global issue. Mm -hmm. So trying to do our part seems like that makes sense. And I appreciate the work that went into it. Thank you, Max. I hope at some point when our agendas aren't quite so overloaded that we have a chance to talk about this plan in more depth along with the Planning Commission and with the Essex Energy Committee because it's a really important conversation and I'm not sure that our greater community is entirely aware of everything that we're trying to do. So, um, And also I believe the Essex Energy Committee submitted a statement in support of this uh, plan as yes. well. Okay, so thank you Energy Committee for doing that. I, I'm sorry. Oh, absolutely, yeah. We'd love a public reading. We'd love a public reading. Thank you. That's what yeah. I was looking for, but I couldn't see. Natalie, <laughs> you come to the mic. Come to the mic, please. Oh, sure. In the center. Well, let's do it for the viewers at home. Uh, again, a statement of support. Uh, and I'm Natalie Braun. I'm a member of the Essex Energy Committee. And this is a statement of support drafted for the enhanced energy plan that Melanie just um, outlined for us. The Essex Energy Committee is very pleased to support adoption by the select board of the proposed Essex Community Energy Plan prepared by the Chittenden County Regional Planning Commission and presented at various community meetings through Melanie Needle at CCRPC. The Energy Committee is a group of volunteers from diverse professional backgrounds committed to renewable energy development and to combating the global climate change crisis at the local level. 
The committee is charged under Section 1F of its charter with assisting the town and village in pursuit of activities related to adoption of renewable energy resources and energy efficient measures. That assistance specifically extends under the charter to helping with the energy section of the town and village plans. Given the nature of the climate change crisis, the current two-page energy section of the town plan does not measure up. As an outgrowth of Act 174 of 2016, the state law setting the objective of reaching 90% renewable energy in Vermont by 2050, the Energy Committee members assisted in preparing the Regional Energy Plan over two years, mainly through participation at meetings with CCRPC officials and with representatives of other municipal energy committees and task forces. After the Regional Plan was adopted in 2018, the Energy Committee encouraged the Municipal Community Development Office to take advantage of CCRP funding to develop the Enhanced Energy Plan. Following its initial release, Energy Committee members developed comments and edits at its own meetings, joined work sessions with town officials, made a presentation to the Economic Development Committee, and attended two joint meetings of the Village and Town Planning Commissions over the course of just under a year in connection with the plan. In total, committee members spent what amounts to dozens of hours working with regional and municipal planners, developing and finalizing the enhanced plan for Essex that sits before you, maybe, or, or is online, or somewhere, anyway, available to you. The Essex plan, Essex Energy Plan, contains smart, aggressive goals and critical data to help this community move towards a livable future. Even that may not be enough. Climate change threatens our continued way of life as citizens of Essex, as Vermonters, as Americans, and as human beings. The Essex Energy Committee remains focused on working together with the Select Board to achieve these goals while maintaining strong, positive communication with each other to avoid misunderstandings and to de-escalate any potential dis concerns that could distract us from effectively dealing with the climate change crisis. We take on good faith that every level of municipal government will work to implement these goals and measures to combat this existential threat. For our part, we're committed as members of the Essex community to use the authority vested in us through our charter, Essex Energy Committee, to use the authority vested in us through our charter to track municipal energy data, research courses of action, make and implement cost-saving recommendations, develop and manage educational programs, and promote and look for funding everywhere we can to implement this plan. But nothing can start unless our community leaders adopt this plan. We trust you will take the right action tonight. Thank you. Natalie, thank you very much. And thank you to the entire Essex Energy Committee. And Melanie, thank you for being patient and coming back to us a second time to go over this with us. So Select Board, we have a recommendation to adopt the Essex Community Enhanced Energy Plan. Would anybody like to make a motion? <clears throat> I move that the select board, select board adopt the Essex Community Enhanced Energy Plan with the con condition that any substantive changes by the Essex Junction trustees will require review and readoption by the select board. A second, please. Second. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? All right. We have adopted the Essex Community Enhanced Energy Plan. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Natalie. <laughs> it is a big deal. You should clap. OK. Yes, Greg. Just one comment. Uh, if anybody is looking to make comments, Melanie's asked that they be received by July 12th um, so that she can incorporate them into the plan when the trustees see it. Thanks, Greg. Thanks to staff as well. Nice yes. job. All right, next item to be discussed under business, item 5D, discussion of potential changes to the firearms ordinance. So thank you everyone who is in the audience this evening to take part in this conversation. I'm gonna to talk to you for a few minutes 
and tell you the lay of the land and how we're going to proceed tonight, and then we will begin. Um, I'm going to tell you what to expect tonight in terms of a meeting overview, what we've done so far, next steps after tonight, <coughs> and how tonight's public comment will work. There will then be a select board discussion. We will have the public comment period, and then we will return to the select board for further deliberation. So this is a continuation of a select board discussion considering changes to the Town of Essex Firearms Discharge Ordinance. Tonight, the select board will discuss and deliberate the Firearms Discharge Ordinance as it relates to sports shooting ranges. We will not be discussing discharge boundaries or dates tonight. We will also not be discussing starting up a town shooting range tonight. After the select board has its discussion on sports shooting ranges, we will open the floor to the <coughs> public for comments, and I'll give you more direction about that in a few moments. After the public comment period, I will bring the discussion back to the select board table to get a sense of the board regarding changes to the ordinance related to sports shooting ranges. Depending on the wishes of the select board, I will then direct staff to draft a final amended version of the existing ordinance to reflect the changes discussed this evening as well as changes discussed at previous meetings to be reviewed by the board at the next meeting. Everybody good so far? Okay. So up to now, this has been a year-long process and the select board has received a lot of input from many sources. We have heard from hundreds of residents at public forums, online forums, and multiple meetings and have received and read volumes of opinion, information, resources, and concerns from all kinds of people. We also have the 2009 report from the Firearms Task Force and recommendations from three different Essex police chiefs, as well as legal opinions from the town attorney. Passions and emotions run deep in the community on this topic. We recognize the difficult nature of this discussion, and we remind everyone here tonight and who's watching on TV and online at home that it is the select board's responsibility to improve the safety of the entire town of Essex while also preserving the quality of life, traditions, and freedoms that our residents enjoy. Here is a summary of the work done so far regarding shooting ranges and some key facts. By Vermont statute, existing shooting ranges established before 2006 are not subject to any new regulations the board may decide to implement. At its November 5th, 2018 meeting, the select board began discussing firearms discharge ordinance in relation to sports shooting ranges. The board discussed and the public provided feedback on a proposed shooting range registration process intended to identify existing ranges and establish basic safety precautions. No decisions were made at that meeting and no additional changes were made to the ordinance at that time. Tonight, the select board will continue that discussion. As for next steps, we are looking at July 15th as the next meeting to review the firearms discharge ordinance. However, if we do not feel comfortable with where we are at the end of tonight's meeting, we will not rush the process of crafting new ordinance language. At the July 15th meeting, the board may vote to accept the amended firearms discharge ordinance, or we may further amend it. Once the boards accept an ordinance, the public hearing process begins. By Vermont statute, we must hold one public hearing about the proposed changes to the ordinance. After that public hearing, the select board can adopt the ordinance and it will take effect. If there are no further changes to the ordinance, we anticipate final passage to occur at the select board's August 19th meeting. Almost done, thank you. Residents always have the option to challenge any new adopted ordinance by circulating a petition calling for townwide vote on whether to overturn the ordinance. Petitions must be signed by 5% of registered voters of the town of Essex and must be submitted within 44 days of the ordinance being passed. Currently, there are 16,077 registered voters in Essex, so 5% of that would be 804 validated signatures. The select board would then have to hold a special meeting on the question, a town-wide Australian ballot vote, within 60 days. The new ordinance would remain in effect until the results of the vote are known. So as for public comment this evening, 
We want to hear your feedback on our discussion, and at the appropriate time, I will open the floor to audience comments. Please remember, this is a select board decision. The select board will absolutely hear what you have to say, but this is not a negotiation. We have heard your concerns, and we will continue to weigh your input. We may not produce the outcome you want, and we realize that it may be excruciating to watch that happen. But please be assured we hear you and we are balancing many interests. Please keep your comments respectful and brief and focus on new things we may not have heard. Please do not interrupt or have hot side conversations while others are speaking. And please direct all comments to me as a select board chair. Speakers will be given a limited time for their comments if your time runs out, we will cut you off. <coughs> Evan is going to be our official timekeeper. And please be respectful of other people's time. If someone ahead of you makes the point you wanted to make, please just say, I agree with that person, or ditto, rather than repeat it. And remember to state your name clearly when you get to the mic. So I will ask this twice, to, I'll ask it now and then I'll ask it again when it's time, but how many people in the audience this evening would like to speak? Can I get a show of hands? It kind of depends on what you guys talk about. Okay, understood, <laughs> understood. Okay, so we have about 10 people, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Excellent learning. About 15. about 15 people have raised their hands. It's gonna be about a minute, 30 seconds per person, so. The select board is now gonna start the discussion and I'm gonna ask Max Levy, who was the chair at the time of the conversation starting, to bring us up to speed on what we've discussed regarding shooting ranges. Okay. Thank you, Max. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, November 5th, at the November 5th, uh, 2018 select board meeting, uh, where outdoor sports shooting areas were the main topic, the select board discussed Establishing a process to identify the locations and number of private shooting ranges or shooting areas within the borders of Essex and have this information available to the Essex police and public. The select board proposed establishing a process to increase the awareness among shooting range owners of the need for safety standards. And the select board directed staff town, town staff, sorry, to draft up a notification form in collaboration with law enforcement for the select board's consideration to be reviewed and discussed at a future select board meeting. That's tonight. The outdoor shooting range area or shooting area notification form might consider requesting such information as, but not limited to, name of the property owner, address and par parcel ID number of the property, date the range was established, the intended use of the range, a site plan of the entire property including the layout of the shooting area showing key attributes and structures, and a method to help ensure the shooting area is constructed and maintained according to standards at least as stringent as those defined by the National Rifle Association Range Manual for Private Ranges. The staff has drafted up such an outdoor shooting range notification form for the select board to consider tonight. Thank you, Max. You're welcome. And now I'd like to ask Greg Duggan to share with us or to review the notification form and your memo in our packet this evening. Sure. Um, so the memo in the packet uh, brings a kind of recap of what Max and Elaine just explained, um, a little bit of history of where we came from and how we get to where we are. Uh, there's some proposed language for a new ordinance language in the, in the packet. Um, it defines a firearm. Uh, it also has language about an outdoor shooting range conditions, um, updates to the violations and penalties. And the focus uh, probably should be the <coughs> language about the outdoor shooting range conditions. Um, the key component there being this notification form. There's the language about the uh, proposed language for a draft ordinance. The notification form um, it was put together in conjunction, uh, myself, uh, the police department, um, legal advice from the, the town attorney, 
and some other staff members worked on this, um, a few others to try to pull it together, give the select board something to review and, and um, give comment on. As Max said, the proposed notification form requests information about property address, property owner, parcel ID number, date the range was established, type of firearms to be used, intended use of the range, expected days and week, days of the week and hours to be used, uh, the site plan of the range showing applicable information drawn to scale about property lines, um, the layout of the range, uh, including safety features such as shooting stations, firing lanes, target areas, shot fall zones, safety fans, backstops, berms, and baffles, um, existing and proposed structures within a quarter mile of the range, and any other appropriate information. Uh, the form as constructed also requests proof of homeowner's insurance with a minimum liability of $500,000. And uh, certification from the range owner that the property is constructed and maintained according to the standards that are set at least as stringent as the standards printed in the National Rifle Association range manual. Um, that's where we're starting at. Uh, the town attorney had pulled together, done some research to look at existing ordinances and laws elsewhere in the country um, to give us something to go off of. Uh, a lot of research into Vermont state law, and that's, that's where we're at. But basically, uh, from feedback on the select board, looking for a way for shooting range owners to provide notification to the town of where the ranges exist and what type of use may be happening on that range. So I can try to answer questions about that. Greg, thank you. I, I know that staff has done an enormous amount of work on this project, so thank you very much for your continued attention to it. All right, select board, how would you like to proceed? Um, would you, I'd like to focus, like I said, strictly on shooting ranges, the materials in the packet today. So um, if anyone wants to start off with comments, otherwise I'm gonna go right down the line. Okay, Max. Uh, th this form at the end, it shows that it would be uh, signed off by the select board, but I'm wondering if it would make more sense to actually have this be the purview of the, the police, not to sign off on it, but at least to acknowledge that this form has been filled out and received, and if they have any questions or concerns uh, about uh, accepting that uh, notification form for whatever reason, that those special cases perhaps should come to the select board as the exception as opposed to the rule. So you're suggesting that the sign off at the bottom of this form not come from this board, but rather come from the police department. Right, and the police would, like the clerk would do when they receive, say, a uh, tax payment, they say, you know, received, mm -hmm. uh, and then it's dated, and then it goes into the file. Uh, that they have, it's open to the public, and I'd like to ensure that any forms that do come in that get put in our packet, just at least uh, as a reading file. Okay. Uh, but just have the exceptions that the police see for whatever reason they have a concern to then come to us to see what we should do. And what do you foresee as an exception, and what do you foresee this board would do with that exception? Uh, well, if, if we have these required to be renewed every, I don't know, couple of years, say, and similar to like a liquor license where you, you will look at the owner and see have there been any violations towards that. And I would hope the police could do something similar to see if there are any violations that were uh, documented um, against that particular range. And if there are, then I would like to see those, for example, as exceptions to come to us so that we can better understand what's causing those um, violations, okay. for example. Anybody, Pat? Um, so I had some questions about the form itself, just the level of detail. Um, I'm wondering how much of that is necessary for the form itself, um, like just as an example, like I think that it's clear that we, as a select board, kind of want to have an idea for where the shooting ranges are in town. Um, but, you know, some of the specific questions, and I'm just, you know, because I'm obviously a little bit more new to the process, um, what's the reasoning for having, for example, the type of firearm 
listed within the shooting range form itself, um, or you know the specific times that we expect them to be in use. Um, you know because you know expected to be in use versus you know are we going to hold people who fill out this form to the expectation of what they put for the time of usage, and if we aren't, is there a reason to have it in there when we already have a you know we already know that there's a sunset to sunrise um, you know uh, uh, sorry lost the word <laughs> um, you know uh, yeah on it so I'm just uh, I guess I want to get a, a little bit of a clear idea for why those are in there um, I'm, I'm pretty sure this relates to the May 2006 standard that's set in Vermont statute, but I'm going to let Greg answer that more specifically. Sure. Um, I'd say three main reasons. Uh, first off, a asking for the type of firearms. Um, that goes back to the NRA range building manual and wanting to know for the police when the police take a look at it and can sign off and say that you know, when somebody certifies that it's been constructed uh, according to the standards in that range manual that the, the safety for the safety measures for a high-powered rifle are going to be different from a shotgun or a pistol. Um, so that's part of it. Another piece is to give notification to the neighbors. Um, that's part of the point of this notification form is to let people know what's out there and what they can expect if someone's buying a house or moving, moving elsewhere in town. Um, they can have an expectation of what might be near them as far as firearms and, and well, as far as shooting goes at a shooting range. Um, and lastly is the historical record. As Elaine mentioned, uh, the 2006 law, anything in existence prior to 2006 can't be regulated beyond its historical use. Um, so if, if something's on record prior to 2006, it, it's putting that in writing. Um, also, if anything ever changes in the future, there's a record in, in place there, whether it's state law or some other type of guideline, uh, there's some sort of documentation to, to keep track of that. So that was the reason. Okay, and the, if I then, uh, as a follow-up, I'm wondering if there would be a change for someone who's using a shooting range, say, you know, they fill out the form and they only put shotgun on there, but then a year down the road, they want to use a rifle at their sport shooting range. What are, would that be a violation that would then result in some of the finer penalties here? Or would we expect that if that were to happen, that we want them to contact the police and let them know that there's a change to what they originally filled out on the form? Just procedurally, I'm, I'm kind of wondering how that change would be made if it's you know something that we are going to just you know request you know let us know, or if we would you know hold them in violation of the form as they filled it out. I think the expectation would be that if there is a change in use, then you would have to come back and fill out an updated application form saying whatever it was that was changed. Annie. I think if that's so, it should state, like <clears throat> when you apply for state aid, it says and it, on the form it says if your income changes, you must. So I feel like if we if we oh, I don't I think we can just assume that and then it's confusing I think if we're gonna do that it should say that or not say that I'm not saying it has to say that. I'm saying if we decide that it either needs to say it or not say it. I don't think we can just all walk around in assumption I think that's a lot to ask of people um, Annie, do you have any other questions or comments on this form <clears throat> quite frankly um, I see a lot of people I deeply respect um, and plus a lot of people I don't know sitting here and I'm watching faces and I'm curious about what people have to say, mm -hmm. but um, I'm still listening a lot and um, keeping up with what was already um, learned. Okay. So I have curiosity, but I don't have, um, I think Patrick did a great job. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Annie. <laughs> uh, yeah, a couple things. Um, I, we've, we've met, it's been mentioned that the intent of the form is to provide information to the police and to the public. Um, I think that if we're, if we're going to collect this information, we should also load it into E911. Uh, e uh, there's a designation in there for shooting ranges. So, if, I mean, one of the intents for 
doing this is to improve public safety. So I think if every shooting range that we have an application for also has a pinpoint in E911 so that if an emergency occurs there, its location is quite well known to the emergency responders. Um, I'd like that, you know, add that if, if, um, if we go down this road to do this. Okay. Um, with regard to the signatures, um, I think this, if we do this, again, the select board should be the responsible parties for signing and approving it um, rather than putting that uh, on the police to do that. I think they certainly will review them. Um, I think the other thing is that we will have to have a discussion about what criteria we would ever use to reject one. Um, are we ever going to, you know, how would we decide to say no in any case? Um, and I, and I, I, I also question the, the and I guess I understand that the, the, uh, the, two, the 2006 date has to do with level of use, um, and that's why the, the question in there is about what, what the expected days of the week and hours uh, are, are in there. Um, I, 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 I'm, I'm just struggling a little bit with how we'll use that data if it's not if it's if it's if it's just filled out to be all hours of all days during daylight hours yeah. and all weapon types are checked and right. um, I, I, it, it loses some of its value at that point if if if, if there's just a, you know, a broad brush put to it by the applicant um, so um, and I, so I don't know I don't know I don't know I don't know what the value of those questions is okay so. Max, yeah, I'm sort of leading where uh, where Patrick is about the uh, with the types of, of firearms. I I heard what, what Greg had to say, but the, the the range manual I believe is specific to designs for type of uh, firearms. So if if you're you know you have the the, the big ones, then it has a, a requirement to, to meet the, the least the least stringent standards. Uh, for those, and if it's going to be, say, a 22 pistol, it would be sort of self-correcting, and you would have, you know, a different requirement. So I think if they're going to sign, if the owners are signing off saying that they're going to comply with the NRA standards for shooting ranges for for private ones, uh, and it's they know what weapons they're going to or firearms they're going to use, and they needs to be designed accordingly. Um, so I I don't. Know if we really need that detailed information, but I guess we really need to hear from our police on that. And then the expected days of the week, we do have that defined by town ordinance right now. And to, to have a lot of different ranges of time out there um, may make it even more difficult to um, for the police to uh, patrol, or not patrol, but to, to take care of. So if we have that in the, in, in the ordinance already, the, the time limit, I would, maybe we can keep it simple. I'm trying to see if we can keep it simple and have it also be effective for what we're, we're trying to do. So there's a balance there. So, um, so those two things I think we might consider uh, eliminating from the, from the form. But I, th I think having the police be the, uh, the owners of this and you know, saying that they they received and accepted it, I think, is the, is the right way to go. But again, we can hear more from our uh, police department on that. Uh, I'm going to share a few thoughts, and then I would like to ask uh, Chief Gary and for some input as well. Um, we have an item on here for date range was established, and I know that's to establish the history pursuant to the May 2006 statute. I agree, I do not feel that it's necessary to itemize the types of weapons to be used. It's, I just don't think that belongs on there. And we already, as you've said, we have ordinance that says sunrise to sunset is when you can discharge weapons. So asking people to, spe to specify, while I understand it's a kindness to your neighbors to let them know, that's something that they should be doing anyway and that we should not be dictating that. Um, I'm curious about anyone's questions or comments about the site plan requirement <coughs> for 
the range. We want folks to designate, you know, bring us a map, basically. I'm wondering if you feel that one addition to that would be terrain. Should we be asking people to indicate that there's woods on their property or a hill or ledge? Is that relevant? Is that something we want to know? That's a key attribute that you want to know, I think. Okay. Does that sound like a reasonable addition to the map request? Okay. And, um, you know, I, I also feel that this is something that should be housed with the police department. And I do not feel comfortable asking the select board to sign off on these forms. I am not an expert on any of this, and therefore I will not sign off on any certification that's, that I would have to agree that there's, there's safety here. The only thing I would be willing to sign off on is, yes, the form is filled out. There's, all the boxes are checked. I strongly feel that this belongs with the police, and if they are um, collecting the information, then we can ask them for updates on the number of people who have registered, the locations of the ranges. Um, but I, and if there is, as Max said, an issue on one of the properties, and there's a problem that has to be resolved, that can come to us, and we can talk to the landowner in person in this venue. But I don't um, think that this belongs in the town clerk's office. Um, yes, Andy. Uh, having, having made comments about the, the, the content of the form um, maybe being ir irrelevant, I, I do understand that, that from the perspective of somebody looking to purchase property to understand what's going to be happening next door, and that's, that's one of the, it's not, not specific to shooting ranges. I mean, it's, it's also development where people have issues. They don't know what can be built next door. Okay. Um, kind of thing and so from the perspective of, of, of getting information before you buy um, you know knowing that there's a shooting name range next door and I suppose the next question could be well why don't you go knock on their door and ask them how they use it rather than have it be documented at, by the town I'm sorry I'm wasting time talking myself out of it again but uh, <laughs> uh, I just, just, just wanted to bring that point up well, I, I agree that one primary use, one purpose of this notification form is so that a potential home, home buyer who's shopping for, town, for, for property in the town, they might want to know what's, you know, are there shooting ranges in the surrounding property? And that's one purpose for this. Annie? By the way, depending upon who you are, you might be excited to hear that people have Absolutely. got shooting ranges. Like, let's not Absolutely. forget that it's not only, yeah. I, I, you might be like, yes. Right, I right, want to so live in an area where I can fire my weapon. Absolutely, yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Yes. Just want to also comment that what was added here that all ranges uh, shall have warning signs along the entire perimeter of the shooting range facility. I think that makes a lot of sense to right. give people a heads up that one exists uh, if they haven't looked up a map or whatever. And if they're in the woods and they see that, then they'll. Uh, be made aware, and I think that's important for both the, the property owner and for the person that happens to be walking by. So you're in favor of including with this notification form that the homeowner will post their, their range, post their property right. as having a range? Right. Annie? I think we need to be, if that's a part of it, we need to be specific because you don't, you don't want to make somebody go out there and hang up four million. Like, be clear behind the parameters of that. How far apart must they be? Like, sure. I, I think otherwise, it, again, it's one of those things that's a little goofy and too much work for someone, or be specific. So. Yeah, it, oh, it's, actually, just, the NRA has guidelines for shooting ranges uh, and the posting of signs. Great. And I think one of the ordinances that staff provided to us, I think it was North Carolina has uh, specifics in their ordinance about where to post. So, I mean, it, it's something we can definitely say you need to do. I mean, we already have posting requirements for hunting property, so. Okay. So, I'm gonna pause on select board questions for the moment, and I'm gonna ask Chief Gary, can I ask you to come to the mic and share your thoughts on our discussion?
So I'm going to give you feedback on what I've heard heard you asking questions about this evening. Thank you. With all due respect, and I think in agreement with the town attorney, I would tell you that I think the the form needs to be at the clerk's office, not at the police department's office. Um, mm -hmm. I think we ought to treat it just like you do a liquor permit. Um, you know, we're not looking to keep track of, we want them to know that they're out there and give feedback as your subject matter, matter experts. But I think someone said basically this form comes in and it gets stamped and then you get opinions back from staff about whether it's complete or whether there are concerns. I see that process working the same way as you do with a liquor permit. My recommendation, and I believe the town attorney will tell you that that probably should sit at the clerk's office. Uh, we would be happy, the police department would be happy to review those applications to make sure that they're complete or the clerk's office could do it. And certainly if there's some questions in reference to the range design and does it meet the standards, we'd ha be happy to give you responses back to that uh, the same way that we do with the liquor permits or if we've had complaints in that area in reference to violations in the past. And then it falls back again to potentially the board to make a decision about whether or not it's approved or not approved. Um, some of the questions specifically in reference to types of firearms and intended use, Greg's talked on it, that has to do with historical use. That's a good example of that or, or was the uh, range over in Williston where uh, the Williston attempted to enact a new ordinance that was gonna change regulations in reference to the firing range over there. Um, and that went all the way up to the Supreme Court who basically said you can't change the historical use if the range was established before 2006. What they can do is they can, uh, if there are going to be changes at that, they could regulate that. And so that's kind of where I think Greg's coming from, the types of firearms and the intended use and the times, trying to find a baseline of what is the historical use. And if you want to change things in the future, you've got to kind of have a baseline for that. Um, I think that's what the purpose of that is. E911, uh, they do have uh, firearms maps on that. It's not a registry. The public can't go there and register. It is simply um, the ability of the GIS folks in each town to actually put a pin on the map where those ranges are and is exactly what you talked about, Andy, is uh, for safety purposes. If there was an emergency and you type the address in in that general area or somebody called from a cell phone, it will actually show that there's a range in that area and that may make the 911 folks or our staff uh, be able to respond better about maybe what the resources are needed up there. Um, I actually talked to the E911 folks and they said, yeah, you want to upload pins on the map that say ranges, we can do it. But it's not a registry where either we can provide this information or they would accept information from the public. So getting back to the, um, the date the range was established and the type of firearm, we are not with this process trying to impose any rules on how people use their weapons. We just want to know where the ranges are. So wouldn't it be sufficient to just ask when the range was established? And in the event that, a his, that more information is needed, we can follow up with the individual landowner at that time, as opposed to having them fill this form out with all this extra information. Again, you've, you've, what this does is this in advance gives you some documentation mm -hmm. um, of what the anticipated use is. I agree that if you're going to have a change, you've got to be able to have them come back uh, and update it because they may change what they want to do there. But again, what it is is to give a baseline on the historical usage. If you don't have that and you have a complaint and you decide you're going to want to make a change, you're now going to have to go back and try to see if you can determine what was the use there. But that's what we're doing now. I mean, we don't have any history Correct. at the moment. Correct. So we just want to have that baseline which says, yes, I certify that my property had a range that existed prior to 2006. But beyond that, I mean, I'm just trying to be devil's advocate here as mm -hmm. to the necessity for collecting more information than we need to collect. If you decided to want to change it later on, you may then have to go and change the ordinance to start collecting that data. So I think what this was is try to anticipate that and collect what you needed in order to be able to, if you had a question about use changing, um, you had the information you needed, sure. potentially. Um, yeah, you can choose not to do it, um, and then if you decide to change, you're going to have to go back and figure, you're either going to have to change the ordinance or figure out a way how you're going to go back and track that, which is probably going to be tough. Right. But I imagine, I remember when we first talked about this in November, um, one of the um, lines in the description of this proposed registry that we were talking about said that the proof of the existence of the range was dependent on the owner. And there were some very unhappy audience members saying, you know, like, this was my great grandfather's property. I have no documentation that says that I 
that we had a range here. I think we're going to ex ex experience that difficulty regardless of when we ask for the information. I agree. Okay. All right. And you really think it should be at the clerk's office? I do. Okay. And I think the town attorney would tell you that's probably where it should be. I mean, if you intend here is to notify people of location of ranges, it should be in the same place where a colleague of titles, property, land use information is kept, which is the clerk's office. That's the that's the intent. Anybody else have questions for Chief Terry? Go ahead, Andy. Well, uh, it's more a question for us. So if I understand correctly, like liquor licenses, the, the way we do it is there are parameters. Staff decides if the parameters meet the guidelines, then we determine whether or not that's also true, and then we... That's a good question, and I... I struggle with that a little bit because that was why I was leaning towards asking the police to handle this because if a clerk has the application in front of them, the extent of their responsibility should be, is this application complete? They should not have to do any judgment about the quality of the map or the ability to determine whether it's safe. And so if they accept the application and then all the applications for the week get sent over to the police department, are you saying that? you would analyze these applications and determine whether the map that was drawn is safe? I mean, who makes that determination? We would have our firearms range people, uh, and that's where we talked about before, where you could potentially have a committee that did that that was not the police department, right? If you had a group that, that wanted to do that, that were certified experts or a range, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be us. I think it just needs to be subject matter experts that can look at that and say, yes, it meets the standard. Uh, but yes, we do it. Ex that's exactly how we do the liquor permits. They come into the clerk's office. They come over up to us for a review. Uh, the criminal history backgrounds checked. Uh, we see any if there have been any problems, and they make a recommendation back to the board. I can I see that operating this, the same way. And what is the standard? If you see a map that doesn't look right to you, are you going to reach out to the owner? Or are you going to come to us? How I think that's some of the clarification that Andy was talking about is, is I mean, we, we're happy to assist you and actually work with the people from the community about what that standard is. Um, but yeah, if there's something there that, there, you know, you're missing something on that map, we would need to try to follow up and say, hey, we're missing this piece. Can we get this from you? Or we may have to make a site visit. Um, but I think that's part of the big one is what is that standard going to be? What, what determines yes or no there's a problem and can't move further through the process? So we've talked about having the National Rifle Association range manual be, be the standard. And from what I heard from various folks, it's a very large manual. I've heard that it's not relevant to private ranges, that it's primarily for commercial and military use. Can you help us understand exactly what this reference material is and whether it is useful to the regular shooting range owner who has one in his backyard? It's useful. The problem is, is the manual is this thick. And, and so what I would propose is that we put a working group together that involves the community and the police department and subject matter experts and set what that standard is, um, you know, that's using the NRA manual and if there's other stuff. Um, I saw some feedback in reference to, um, you know, providing suggestions. I think that's a great idea, uh, you know, in reference to setting up ranges and that. I think we need to develop that standard uh, that we think meets it and meets that NRA standard. Uh, trying to flip through that manual and decipher what is needed is a nightmare. Um, I think we can whittle that down to something that's acceptable that, that the people that own those, are, it's more clear and concise. So if we had a working group comprised of subject matter experts, the police, perhaps interested members of the public, and they composed this checklist that you would then use as a, as a checklist against all the applications. That's what you're saying. Yeah. And then we wouldn't need a standing committee of people to look at every application as it came in because you'd now have a checklist that was approved by. We could say it met this standard and then we would forward it back to you and say it's met what? Okay. Okay. Annie, did you, or Annie or Andy, someone's hand went up. Annie. Annie. Um. So if I understand, and I think I'm just repeating what you've just said, is what you've all just agreed upon, is that we would put together a working group to determine what the parameters were, solidify that, and then 
have it act like a liquor license situation because we have parameters that are solid that we've agreed upon that we've passed as a thing. I, I have to say I feel a lot better hearing that because my concern is we are trying to do something very basic to help ensure safety but then we're adding this complicated layer of well you need to refer to the range manual and you know having a simplified checklist that we can be assured has been vetted by members of the community who are involved who are going to be subject to this rule that feels like it's making it a more um, approachable easier to understand accessible process so I really appreciate you're making that suggestion chief thank you um, Greg or Evan do you have any questions or comments for us or for chief Gary okay um, Andy so um, if even if we have a whittled down standard at some point there's gonna have to be some there'll be a situation where a judgment call will be need to be made which might imply liability so I just I, I Bill is over there he's not looking at me but uh, <laughs> so I saw so that that's that's where I, I that's where the rub is for me is, is do you know if if there's if we develop what we think is an, an appropriate standard and we make a judgment call are we then liable and what's the what are the implications of that judgment call yeah. that's I think the big thing we need to understand um, my advice would be to put the obligation on the property owner they should be responsible for their ranges and if they're not then they should be liable yeah they better keep they should keep the uh, the ordinance on the ranch or on their property whatever they need to do to make sure it doesn't go off their property. That would be my advice. So, so the only criteria is whether the form is complete or not? Well, right, yeah. because they're certifying. Right. With, with, they a with, with, a, with, a, with a property owner signature. That would be my advice. Yeah. Okay. Um, does anybody have any further questions or comments about the form? Because there's a couple other things we need to discuss as well. Matt, are you good to go? Uh, I just had a follow-up, uh, Chief Gary. Uh, you had mentioned background check in there. Um, just speaking, I, I mean, did you mean specifically like a criminal background check if someone's submitting this? Or do you, did you just mean that like looking for past instances of, you know, if you know, we've had issues with someone who didn't fill out the form properly two years ago and now they're reapplying? Um, I just wanted to make sure there was some clarification about what you meant exactly by that. It would not be us running a criminal background check. Right. I believe the town has the right to do that, uh, but it would not be through us. We're not allowed to do that. Um, what we give back for feedback in reference to liquor, and we could do the same thing in reference, uh, is if we've had complaints in the area in reference to shooting, we could give that back if the board was going to consider or not and wanted to use that, like liquor violations. Uh, where we may have over-serving at a bar. Uh, the board then uses that to make a determination about what they're going to do with a new license and are there going to be any conditions. Um, our records in reference to complaints about shooting are public records. So again, it would just take a little research to pull those and provide those to the board and then the board would make a decision about whether those are relevant or not. But it is not a criminal background check. That's what I thought. I just yeah. wanted to, like, you know, again, just clarify it for the, yeah. the open record. Absolutely. Um, so we had a couple other um, proposed changes in the ordinance that were in our packet on um, this proposed changes to Essex Firearms Ordinance document. Do you have any questions or want to discuss? Um, this is right after the cover memo, Andy. Um, primarily the changes are the fines. So just want to make sure that you've seen them and whether you have any questions or comments. Andy. Um, just a question about, we, we've mentioned annual, but we haven't mentioned a specific date. And I okay. note that on the fines, it's the, 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 the comment about calendar year basis is struck through. Um, so I guess that, that leads to two questions. One is, that, well, one comment, I think we need to set a date that we would need to do the renewals every year. 
And then the other is uh, with regard to first, second, third, fourth offense, is just, is that cumulative? I guess that must be cumulative through lifetime. I guess I've answered uh, my own question there. Oh, I, I don't know. I would, I would defer to Chief Gary to answer that. Yeah, I would think it would be cumulative. And so, so I, I, I understand that a shooting, the existence of a shooting range can pass uh, with a pr property sale. I assume that this, this is by, based on individual, not on. Right. Um, Correct. So if you had someone that's had a fourth or subsequent offense and then has, you go by a calendar year, should they go back to a first offense because you've gone to a calendar year or have you already warned them four times? Right. So do we want to think about a date for renewal? And let's, can we not make it June 30th along with every other appointment that we have to do, <laughs> please? <laughs> um, I, I would be willing to defer to staff for the best time of year for that to happen. We can yeah. discuss that and figure something out, propose something. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And are we talking about annually or every two years or what's the right? Another question for the committee, for the board. Annually, biannually? <laughs> I would be comfortable with biannually and then with a change of use. <coughs> so every other year? Every other unless year, unless you change your use. Annie, do you? That's what I was already thinking. I felt like yearly might be a bit. New applications, change of use. New applications. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling a little bit with the, um, you know, handing in the same form two years later uh, concept. And we, we've had a little bit of this discussion before, and I, I had thought that uh, either change of use or change of ownership would, would be the only reason to require anybody to come back. Um, well, I think for keeping the, the listings accurate and up to date, Perhaps there could be, instead of making someone fill out the whole thing and draw the map all over again, they could have a renewal certification that says, I certify that my application dated 2019 is the same with no changes dated 2021. I mean, would that? I, 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 don't, I don't see the need to have repeat. So you're thinking fill it I, out, I think one it's and a, done. Once and done and until okay. you sell the property or, or um, because because we're not gonna they're not gonna expire right we're not gonna right. we're not gonna tell people your your shooting you haven't renewed your shooting range you haven't in, as far as we know we haven't used your shooting range in five years you can't use it now so it exists, it exists so I don't think there's any Mike, makes makes a lot of sense to require a, a lot of paperwork for us to collect and and um, you know I, I you know, it, it's who's gonna chase them around, chase everybody around to try to get their their uh, permits in so that they can sight in their deer rifle. Um, the, the one I question don't. I have for you on that is what if you are a parcel of land and you have a range and then someone buys the parcel next to you and puts a building closer than previously and now your range is not safe for that abutting building you're gonna have to change your range you're gonna have to re up you know re do your application over is well um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe maybe change of use includes abutting changes to abutting properties. I don't know. I, okay. I, but I, 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 again, I don't think it makes sense to chase people around. Us spending a lot of time finding people, telling them, okay, hey, your your things do bring it in. If we're going to sign them all, we're going to have to sign a hundred of these things. Um, okay. And I don't see the need to do that every year or even every other year, unless there's a change of use or a change of of. Max and then Annie. If our community was static, I would agree with Annie, but we're still de developing and growing. So I think a minimum of every two years, and the town knows where development is happening, and they, you know, we would be aware then if there is a change of an abutting shooting range where now there is a building or something that was not there before. 
So I think it's important to do that. And as we do with liquor licenses, I believe we send an email out to, to establishments. Is that right, Evan? To, and Greg? To uh, let them know it's, it's time to re-up. So um, because we are dynamic and changing, I think it's important to, to keep those up to date if they're going to be of any value at all. Okay. Annie? <clears throat> Does change of use cover the physicality of the range? So let's say you submitted your application and uh, think you're uh, you know, you, and you have a, a new vision or you want to build or grow upon it, what are the parameters of you having to tell us that? W what if you were like, oh, this is going really well. I wish I, I don't know anything about you. Sure. I, I would think that. But like if you wanted to grow your space a little, so does the change of use also talk about the physical parameters and the, and the design or just the use of what you're using? I think it's the any variation from the application oh. that's submitted. So if you've drawn a map and you make a change, you have a new vision and you want to expand yeah. or do something different, you have to you have to do a change of use. Okay. And that will be clear in the language? We would have to make that very oh. clear in the language, absolutely. All right. Are we ready to <coughs> open the floor to public comment? Any other questions or comments before we do so? Okay. And uh, Pat? Super quick. Uh, Pat? Excuse me, super quickly. Um, in some of the <coughs> examples that we've seen, there were listed for application fees. We're not anticipating asking application fees for what we have. Okay. No. Okay. Thank, just a moment, sir. Thank you, everyone, for listening. And now we're going to have our public comment period. Please remember what I told you earlier. Um, you will each have. Show me your hands again. Who wants to speak? Still about 15, maybe 18. <clears throat> a minute, 30 seconds each. I know that's not long, but there's a lot of us here. Please keep your comments concise and brief and try to focus on stuff we have not talked about before, if possible. Be respectful of your neighbor's time. If you want to agree with someone, just tell us you agree with them and sit down. And please direct your questions to me as the chair. And um, remember to state your name clearly when you get to the mic. So I'd love to hear from all of you now. Thank you. Please come to the microphone. If you want to form a line or certainly. Your name? Tim Fahan. I live on Brady Mill Road. Further down on the list on reading files, you have a bunch of lists. And I mean, I don't know what happens with that. Are you reading something? that are coming in that section because there's a lot of ordinance stuff there. Oh, so the reading file is just um, documentation that staff feels we should read prior to the meeting. In this case, it was um, communication from residents and they're just in the re reading file for our information. So just for you guys just for us to read. disseminate it to us. Uh, no, it's in the public reading file, so it's online. Okay, but I just want to know because I didn't want to, we didn't want to talk about this now if we're going to go over more stuff. Oh, no, we're, we're done. Very yeah. good. Thank you. Thanks for waiting. Good evening, Eric Bailey. Um, I'm, a, I'm a certified U.S. Army Maintenance Safety Officer, a former NRA Fire Instructor and NRA Maintenance Safety Officer. Um, the NRA manual uh, contains guidelines, not standards. And those guidelines are for like the best of commercial ranges. Okay. Few, if any, active commercial ranges in Vermont meet all those guidelines is my belief that, those, that that as a standard was put in there to make having a private range in Essex cost prohibitive and basically shut them all down. This, the, the ability to have a safe private range is much narrower than that manual. I mean, if, you've, if you go downhill into a bank of soft dirt with good sight line, that's safe. You know, it's your property. Your bullets are being stopped against Mother Earth, and no one can come in and get in the way. I mean, that it's that simple. Okay. I'd also consider not changing the first defense fine, doubling the rest of them, just because it may it may just be a lack of knowledge. Um, the uh, and we're talking about renewing, you know, this over and over. Originally, it sounded like it was a 
It was just getting to know where these were. Basically, it was just a, a form to find out where Ten seconds. these ranges are that we can not regulate. You know. so. Thank you. <clears throat> Dustin Grusso. Just a quick comment um, following up on the renewals aspect. If we're maintaining that the, it is the responsibility of the landowner to maintain the range and the necessity of renewing the form because the property and the, the adjacent properties have changed for the usage is somewhat irrelevant because it is still the, the responsibility of the landowner to maintain the safe shooting um, zone. Whether or not the property is changed next door or not. The property changed and you can't maintain a safe zone that is still your responsibility. So I don't know that there's a necessity for the town to then redo that. I feel that's somewhat redundant. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Hi, Ben Bro. Um, I have just a couple things. I think that this was supposed to start out as just a notification of where ranges are. And now uh, from this checklist, it's turned into this big long uh, big long notice that's really going to turn into registration it's going to be kept at a clerk's office I feel that this is very much overstepping the authority that's been delegated to the municipality from by the state um, with respect to sporting ranges um, but I guess that'll be decided by a court eventually if, if that's how it goes but um, I think it's way overstepping what the state has uh, delegated to the municipality. Also, I know we weren't gonna talk about the borders, but I do wanna say that when I was reading through there, the 500 foot buffer language is still in the packet and October 15th, we were told that that would be totally removed. So thank you. Hi, Igor Paul, I'm 198 Chapin. and I just wanted to say three short things. Uh, first of all, you know, you mentioned real estate, and as a Vermont realtor, I actually have clients right now that I've been working with that have a concern about ranges and safety. You know, they they don't feel comfortable about guns, and, you know, I showed them a home. Um, the first home I showed them was right next to the Burgess, and I told them that, and they were very happy that I wasn't, you know, trying to make money off them, and told them about the thing, which the other realtor didn't disclose. But, you know, I also understand that it's not realistic for people in a real estate community to know everything about, you know, what, what is the range, you know. You know, if I'm in the woods, I would tell somebody who is concerned that, you know, listen, if you're afraid about hunters, this is Vermont, you might not want to buy a house here, and that's their choice. But, you know, you can't really expect everybody to know everything. It's just, it's just unrealistic. And, uh, and the second, second thing, I moved here two years ago from Moncton, where I used to shoot in my backyard all the time. I'm, I enjoy shooting sports, I'm a hunter, I collect guns. So when I moved, uh, people told me that my neighbors don't like noise, because um, one of my neighbors is um, Sandy Pines Kennels, they have 50 dogs, and my other neighbors um, have horses, sick horses. So I came to them and said, you know, how can we resolve this like neighbors? Because I was really looking forward, I got you know 300 yards behind me. Ten seconds. Thank you. And they say, listen, can you please not shoot guns unless you see a big deer and it's in self-defense near our properties, and you can hunt the back of our properties. And we resulted like neighbors should with respect. I don't see why we should make it a big deal with that. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, Brad Kennison, uh, Bixby Hill Road. Um, I agree that uh, we could voluntarily uh, provide the, uh, the location of a range on a voluntary basis. Um, it's totally unnecessary to have all this information and quite frankly, I think it's um, inconsistent with the statutes. Uh, I, this all precipitated from the, the accident um, 10 years ago with that Professor Reese, and um, also with a few bad actors we have in town that may be operating in, in a careless and negligent manner. And I think it's important that uh, law enforcement approach these individuals and enforce the statutes that are currently on the books. 
Um, if there's a problem in, in uh, prosecuting, I would suggest that um, Chief Gary, the town manager, the chair of the select board, our local state representatives meet with Sarah George, the state's attorney, and garner support from her in terms of prosecution. If you make an example of a few people in town, you're going to solve this problem. And we're not going to have this whole issue, which is spiraling out of control. Thank you. Well, Sarah Salatino, uh, Brigham Hill Road. I have the nursery on Brigham Hill Road. It's a very peaceful place. People have said they really love coming to my nursery. They come from all over New England. Um, but one of the things that we have to deal with with shooting ranges is not so much the, the, sh the shooting range that goes for half an hour at a time, but for four hours at a time, three days a week. Um, it, it is obnoxious. We have customers who are scared to death to come to our nursery and have expressed it. Um, we had on, on Father's Day, we had a, 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 an Afghan, Afghan vet who was really having a hard time with the shooting that was going on down, down our road. One thing I want to make it very clear to the select board, there's a disconnect between the select board and the planning commission. Did you know that the planning commission is, is putting in several cul-de-sacs on either side of Brigham Hill Road, um, which a lot of these shooting ranges are facing right towards? Um, <coughs> I, one woman, there's several houses for sale on Brigham Hill Road. Uh, somebody called me and said, what do you think of, of our road? Um, I want to buy these houses at these two locations. And I said, well, in all due honesty, Twenty seconds. in all due honesty, they are next to, right next to shooting ranges who fire often. Um, also want to remind you, um, if I get hit with vodka, it's very different than getting hit with a, with a, a bullet. Thank you. Hi, Nils Giddens, um, resident of Essex for over 11 years, and most of the time been following this issue ever since being on the Firearms um, Discharge Ordinance Committee some time ago, and I'm happy to see that at least we're continuing to attempt to talk about this. I came in not knowing the specific topic. Um, I was hoping it was going to be more wide-ranging, but on the other hand, I saw what you were talking about, and I thought it might be a good idea, but then... I heard the chief say something like, may need to make a site visit. And I guess now I'm wondering, not to spiral things out of control, but if, if we're getting into this policy for a, a safe community, full disclosure, I have a job at UVM Children's Hospital, if we're, if we're getting into this for, for safety of the community, I guess I'm not sure how you prove that it's safe without a site visit. And I guess I don't know how you could continue to prove that you're safe without monitoring. Now, I'm not saying that I'm aiming to get this spiraling out of control. I'm just saying this policy brings with it a whole lot of stuff that a lot of other people may not have thought about. On that note, uh, you gave a really nice talk there. I also worked in the health field for 35 years. Um, Patty, people say that your name, move please. Here. Oh, Patty Davis. Thank you. Uh, all I want to say is, um, all of us, Essex Junction and Essex Town, why don't we eventually work towards having that Australian ballot vote? Since there are 22,000 of us now living here and recreating here and purchase, Brian French was our realtor and I made sure to look at Saxon Hill Road very thoroughly, being one of the top runners in Vermont for many years. Now that I had to run on dirt um, and it had a sign sex, uh, that said no shooting zone and it's a class three public road and it is the select board's duty 
to be responsible for the safety of Essex and Essex Junction. Please, let's all come together and vote. Gail Allen, I live in Essex, uh, over out in uh, the uh, <clears throat> Saxon Hill area. Um, so I, I have to comment that somebody said something about this potentially not even being outside or being outside of the jurisdiction of the municipality. And, and as you know, it, it may or may not be. It gets a, it's a tricky business. The real problem is that the state laws that govern this are outdated because the state again continues to expand in residential communities are expanding, and they're expanding into places that people used to hunt, or all have always hunted, or have always shot their guns. And, you know, that's the same argument that the Native Americans have been using for 200 years. You're infringing upon my rights to hunt these lands and to shoot my guns, and the truth of the matter is, that still doesn't necessarily make it safe. Now, the bottom line is, there's a guy right down the road from me that has a hunting, that has a shooting range, and he fired in, in, in a three-wall, 10-foot embankments. That is a safe firing range. And, it, and my, my concern was that it was going to be noise. Not even noise. There are safe firing ranges out there, and there are unsafe firing ranges. We were all here last year to hear the testimony of a person that was firing into a sand hill that was directly in the line of fire of somebody's home. And he went and talked to his neighbor, and he didn't get anywhere with them. So we have to speak to the lowest common denominator here, unfortunately, not to the responsible citizens that are here talking about and trying to save their own rights for their own safe firing ranges. That's the problem. We got to make sure that it's safe for everyone. Um, that's really all I need to say. Uh, Brian Murphy, 187 Towers Road Extension. I thank everybody that's spoken here. I've been listening. Um, people will recall when I showed this map at a meeting and it kind of set off an alarm. Um, what prompts me is I think the notification form needs to, and I don't know how it works with liquor stuff, but if you submit it, the, the adjoining property owners need to be notified because they would have some information that bears on this, as well as someone within a quarter mile. Because I will show you the map later. This is a thin slice of land between my house and the, the, the range that I was talking about in the past. And I'm not an adjoining property owner, but I'm within 200 year, yards of a dirt pile. Um, I think the statute and, and the attorney for the town could comment that I think it is problematic to use the word outdoor shooting range. Um, it conflates a lot of the discussion. Um, there is the sport shooting range, which is a state definition. I wouldn't mess with that because I think there's a lot of conflation. I would use it the, the uh, term backyard shooting area. And I'm trying to be neutral. If someone's got a more neutral term, that's fine. But to use the word shooting range or outdoor shooting range conflates it with the state definition, which is very clear. They're talking about commercial ranges that were in existence that were designed and operated. Designed. They were designed for safety and they're operated commercially. And we seconds. step into that. Um, that's all I have to say. Thank you all. Thank you. Hi, my name is Randy Barrows. 
under full disclosure, I'm not a resident of Essex. Am I still allowed to speak? I think so. Okay. You're there. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. Where is he? Where do you live, sir? Pardon me? Do you mind if we ask where you do live? I live in Milton. Oh, thank you. I appreciate it. Okay. Uh, the reason I came tonight is uh, I live in Milton. I've had a range for 40 years. Uh, it's right on the village town limits. Uh, thankfully, we've not had any accidents there at all. We encourage safe handling of firearms. Uh, it's a safe place to shoot. Police department actually qualifies on my range. Uh, I've been an instructor of fish and wildlife for 38 years, teaching hunter safety. So we found that people that don't attend these classes are the ones that tend to get in trouble down the road. So these private ranges are very good. People get there, they get one-on-one -on -one instruction. Uh, as far as the insurances that you're proposing, that would basically shut most of us down. The NRA manual, this gentleman uh, advice, it's a great manual if you're going to go commercial and you're going to do big things. Uh, financially, none of us in this room could afford it. Uh, being a good neighbor, uh, when I moved there, it was kind of a rural area. I now have an 88 house development across the road from me. Uh, there's always concerns about the firearm shooting, so I normally plan to uh, have a shoot on the days that they're having opening house. 20 seconds. Across the road, so the people that are potential buyers are fully aware of what happens in our neighborhood. Uh, basically, uh, I think the chairwoman suggested the town of Essex open their own range. I think that would be an excellent idea. Thank Financially, you. you probably couldn't do it, but uh, I think it would make a lot of the problems go away. Thank you. And my end is, uh, please. Sir, your time is up. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Sean McEwen, 21 Turnberry Ridge. So, <clears throat> I think one of the situations is like, we we had a range right behind our house, and then we ended up by building in like 2000, so we had to put it behind my brothers. We do a lot of like just sighting the rifles and things like that, and you know we're right near the village even, and I don't really have too many neighbors. Let the neighbor next door know when I'm gonna shoot. Don't really have any problems, and you think you know you're pretty close to Athens Drive. You have people calling the police all the time, but we're not using it that often. But if somebody invests money in making a range really nice in their backyard, then they're going to want to use it a lot, okay? Because they invested that money. It's not like they're going back out there to just to sight the rifles in because they got to get something for what they've invested in there. And I will say again, and I was an alternate on the firearms ordinance board before with, with Mr. Nels, and. I know you didn't want to talk about it, but I think a town range would alleviate a lot of problems. And a lot of people are enthusiasts that went there, there'd be camaraderie, they'd get to know each other, and maybe some of the people would get a chance to go there that are kind of leery of guns. But the guy sighting in his rifle, I don't think is what people have problems with, is people when they're shooting a lot. And if you had a range like that, probably would get built more to the NRA standards. Thank you. <coughs> uh, Richard Smith, uh, East William Street. Uh, I am a little bit concerned about saying the term that we're going to make policy down to the lowest level. Uh, as we talked about liquor licenses, we don't punish all the restaurants and all the establishments within a jurisdiction because one of them at the lowest level is known to continually break the law. Uh, so I think we hold a standard and we hold people accountable to that standard, but we don't punish everybody in a group every time that we go to our lowest level. All of us don't lose our driver's license when somebody else gets a DUI. So we have to start thinking about that. And we can't always say we're gonna make policies to the lowest level, or else none of us would do anything without the federal government telling us, or the state government, or our local government, telling us what we can and cannot do. So we need to get out of our heads that we need to policy down to the lowest level or else we will not get to make any decisions. Thank you. <coughs> Hi, I'm Brian, Brian Jeldon, Franklin Street. Uh, 
Um, and sort of a technical comment. Um, I'm not sure who the uh, heard some comments on the NRA range manual, um, and I don't know whether it's a good or a bad standard. But I'm concerned about um, sort of incorporating <coughs> private private uh, private organizations uh, regulations into into an ordinance because they could change that out from under us. I think that uh, there was some discussion about um, using that as base. Although it's, hey, I know you don't like the lowest common denominator, but as a as a basis for standards that we were <coughs> Max was talking about that. But yeah, I think we need to come up with some standards that are ethic standards um, and use um, use professionals like Brad TNR in this case um, to as a starting point. Thanks. Thank you. <coughs> I am uh, Brad with Fountain uh, One Thirty Three Graven Hill Road. Um, I would ask the town to consider a hunting or shooting by written permission only form. It would really simplify things. It would put liability on the landowner, as I understand it already is. Um, that way, trespassers are not covered. Um, I'm not willing to cover somebody that walks onto our property and discharges a firearm without my permission. So they would need a permission slip where basically that's a common form just registered with the town or even just left at the homeowner level. Um, the people that are going to be dangerous are probably not at these meetings. They're probably not even Essex Town members. They're going to come from other towns. They're going to see a, an animal discharge a firearm where they probably shouldn't, maybe. Um, and I would ask everybody that, um, how would you feel if you wanted to change a tire on your car, but you first had to register your driveway as an automotive shop? That's the way that we feel, or I believe a lot of people would feel. Hi, Brian. I totally agree with the comment that was just made. I find it kind of insane that as it stands today, as I understand it, and I'm relatively new to this conversation, but as I understand it, I'm not a hunter. I don't close my property, but I can be outside with my son and someone can shoot a deer five feet from my son, and that's okay, but if I hang a target on a tree and do a shooting, I'm, and, I don't, and I don't sign up for this, I get fined. So it just seems that the, the allowances of discharge of firearms for certain reasons or other reasons is not taking into account the property owner's rights in terms of using their property for the way they deem not to be used. So they said, I'm not a hunter, I don't hunt, but I don't post my property, but at the same time, I don't think it makes sense to restrict my rights. You have to fill out forms to restrict my rights, and also have to fill out the same form to say I don't want someone else hunting on my property. That, that seems crazy that I would have to fill the same form out twice so I can shoot on my property and I have to fill out a form so someone else can't shoot on my property. That, that just seems disconnected in my view. Thank you. Would anybody else like to speak that has not already spoken? <clears throat> Hello, my name is Scott Chapman. Um, I see this as a, a constitutional issue. It's prior restraint the civil right. Whether you lock light firearms or not, and you discharge firearms, it is a right. It's an individual right affirmed by the Constitution of the United States and the state of Vermont. You have no right to limit that. The way that this is written, you are forcing a person to ask the police department for permission to discharge a firearm on private property and, in, in, in a sense, pay a poll tax by providing a liability insurance policy. You don't have the right to do that. Um, I heard the chief refer to uh, uh, liquor licenses. This is a right, not a privilege. Would you apply this to the right to uh, practice a religion of your choice, to talk to your lawyer? Are you going to en enact ordinances that prevent that and make you prove that you provided uh, financial responsibility to that? that you get fined if that's not done in a way that you see fit. You do not have the power as a community to infringe upon the constitutional rights of Vermonters, period. I know that some people don't like my seconds. That's fine, but this is a right, not a privilege. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, good evening, my name is Randy Draper. I live at 184. Towers Road Extension, right across the street from the Murphys. You've seen a lot of evidence over the course of the last six months about the unauthorized, unsupervised uh, 
shooting range, backyard shooting range across the street from my house. Um, although I wasn't in a direct line of fire, I was clearly at a tangent and uh, had myself uh, asked that homeowner across the street who has that fire range um, to please limit the sighting of his and his children's or grandchildren's uh, rifles um, because of how nervous it makes me feel and how dangerous um, I think it can be um, if you're irresponsible. I respectfully disagree. We're not talking about constitutional rights. We're talking about public safety. And I would just recommend that the board keep that in mind. Nobody is trying to limit uh, the appropriate and safe use of the backyard shooting range. We're just concerned for our families and for our children and for ourselves. It's a public safety issue. Please don't forget that. Thank you. <coughs> OK, uh, one final call. Yes, sir. I usually get in trouble whenever I do this. Kendall Chamberlain, Old Pump Road. We've had a range on our property since 1948. First my father, now I. I know where I live. You know I shoot there. There's never been a problem. I don't expect to be treated like a criminal until I commit a criminal act. I do agree with that person. It's a constitutional right to discharge weapons on your own property, as long as you don't affect anybody else. I don't agree with it that it's a safety issue because I don't see any evidence of it being a safety issue. Hunting is one of the safest things you can do in Vermont. Prove it. So I would just hope that the board doesn't overstep their bounds because you will find yourself in litigation. You've already been uh, threatened with litigation. It's going to happen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for taking the time to be here this evening and to share your thoughts. We have listened closely. I hope you saw that many of us were taking notes. We are absolutely committed to doing what's right for the entire town of Essex. So we're gonna take the conversation back to this table now. We're gonna deliberate and we're going to make some recommendations for changes to the ordinance or not. And then we'll ask staff to bring back to us an amended draft for our next meeting. So you're welcome to stay and listen to our deliberation, but the public input portion of the meeting is now closed. All right, does anyone have any thoughts to share based on what you've heard? Any further questions that might have come up, Pat? Um, yeah, I mean, I heard a couple of what I thought were really good points. Um, you know, we're not looking to create a registry. So I think that further sort of solidifies in my mind that the types of firearms that should be used on the form is really unnecessary, just the knowledge that they're being shot because I think that that, honestly, the whole idea of a registry rubs people the wrong way. And if, you know, just, if it's not necessary for the form, it doesn't really need to be there. Um, and something that we didn't discuss before, but it was brought up, the insurance panel, or excuse me, the, the insurance uh, liability of uh, $500,000, I'm assuming that was pulled because there was a similar, you know, uh, uh, form that we saw from Pitt County, was it, where they used the... Pitt County, North Carolina, and the state of Texas. Um, what I don't think any of us intend to do here is to have that listed on here as some sort of go around to prevent people from financially being able to have a shooting range. Um, so out of curiosity, do because I don't know off the top of my head, what sort of financial burden is a liability like that placing onto a homeowner's insurance? Do we know? Do we have an idea? I'd have to do some more research. Right, because you know, if it's going to add $500 a month to people's insurance bills, then you know, uh, that's an issue. Um, so I think we need to have the answer to that question before we can really uh, put any specific number on there. Uh, Annie or Annie? <clears throat> I'd like to say that I really appreciate how kindly and respectfully people spoke uh, 
it, it was just really beautiful to watch the pattern of how everybody waited for someone else to go. It was, it was just so, I, I feel that we have been so respected and our community has been so respectful. And I, I am so grateful for that. I have learned more um, this evening than I've ever known before and I feel I need more time to ingest what I've learned, but I know that we're not making an ultimate decision this evening. Um, I think that, and I don't know enough to really be saying this, but I wanna kind of toy with it out there that um, it's true that we can't really be looking at this. It, it does have to be more uh, backyardy, not, not uh, like we need to make sure that we're understanding financial costs for people, respect people's rights to, uh, I, I, think, I think that I do believe that there's a way to formulate a situation that feels as respectful as this felt. And I, I think we can do it. And I do think that we need a working group and a way to start to have these bigger conversations that has a, a house, even if it's not a regular one, at least something to start with. I, am I making any sense? I don't know. No, you make sense, definitely. Andy? Um, yeah, I just want to say I, I do appreciate all of the comments. A um, um, couple of things I learned tonight that made, are actually things I need to learn more about um, is posting rules. Are those those are are those uh, state mandated or are those is that a, a, a town ordinance or no trespassing? Yeah, I believe it's state. State. Okay, so I kind of thought it, thought it was. Okay, so. Um, and the, the, the unique thing about what we're doing here is it's not done any place else in the state, so we don't have a local reference or any state ordinance or state statute to go by. Okay. Um, I think at this point, this the uh, um, the other thing. Yeah, I don't know. Um, the some of the other material that we we received indicated and there were a couple of comments here as well that a uh, a voluntary uh form uh sounds like it would be more palatable to many um it it, it um but again i don't know if you just get the the, the well-behaved people at that point um so i'm i'm Stirring that around in my head. Okay. Matt? If the uh, NRA range manual is not the right manual for shooting range guidelines, then we need to find out what the right <coughs> guidelines or standards should be for Essex. I don't, I don't know what that would be at this time, but if the, the idea is not to make it prohibitive to have anyone allowed to have a shooting range and if that NRA manual would drive that then that's not acceptable. Mm -hmm. So to try to define what the right standards or guidelines are for Essex, I think we got to figure that out. I don't know where. So Chief Gary Rep made a suggestion of a possible committee that would help define those standards or guidelines so that those would be the enforcement um, guidelines that would be used as opposed to the NRA. As a possibility. Is that something that is palatable to everyone? As long as it's palatable to the attorney for uh, it, liability. Andy, you it, it gives you the same, I mean, if, you, if we define those standards, we are liable for those standards. And so I think it, it goes against what we said earlier, that it's, it's no, you know, what if the standards developed were derived from the NRA manual? We're, we're still picking and choosing what the rules are. And so we've made a judgment and we're liable for those judgments. So it would feel more, it would feel stronger for you if we went with a specific guideline like, like the NRA manual. Well, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not convinced we have a path here to do this without taking on some liability. 
Thanks. I think rather than assuming that that's a real liability issue, I think we ought to let the attorney mull that over, not put them on the spot now, but say if we did get a citizen group together to define that mm -hmm. and then replace NRA range manual for, you know, Essex range manual, is that a liability issue? If it is, that's a problem. If it's not, then maybe we have a pack. So what I'd like to do at this point in time is review very quickly the notification form and get the sense of the board about various parts of it so that we can give direction to the staff as to what to do <coughs> next. Um, the, top, the top portion, property address, owner, parcel ID, and date range was established. Is that something That's folks are okay with? Makes sense. Yep. Yeah. Okay types of firearms to be used Is I personally don't want? feel it's necessary I think that the knowledge that the range is there is enough in my opinion you don't have to give a thumbs up or a thumbs down so yeah not in not case that right absolutely Great. you're not ready I, to make that I really want to uh, Think. Okay. Thanks. I appreciate that space. No problem. That's always an option. Andy? Um, I appreciate Chief Gary's comments about having about the, the having a historical record of use, uh, especially the, the, the one thing that might be missing here is we might have to have, we should have, may possibly have different questions based on whether it's prior to 2006 or after 2006 that the range was established. Um, to, to understand what rules apply, um, in, in, so 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 I think that my understanding of the the, the 2006 thing is that any range that it, the, the the use of a range that was the way a range was used prior to 2006, we we have no we can't make any changes to that. Correct. Mm. Right. And and so I think. If we don't know what that use was, we don't know um, how we're how we're constrained, or if we're not, con or if we are constrained, or what you know. And so that I I I, I kind of struggle with with including, it, and I struggle with not including it because of because of that that case, you know, where if, if somebody's been used 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 to use their range for uh, you know sighting in their rifle and then that somebody else buys the property and they start using automatic weapons on that property that's a significant change but I don't know what we can do about it anyway so um, we're, we're not we're not intending with this to make any changes to how anybody uses their their any range so um, so I have talked myself out of the value of having that part in there. Are you saying that just having the date the range was established was is sufficient? I think at this point, yes. Okay. I'll think about it more though. Okay. Max. Yeah, I think in this version that that's not necessary to have that types of firearms at this point. Um, I don't want it to appear like it's a gun registry. That's not the purpose and. It could be misinterpreted as such, so I'd say for this version, we could omit it. Okay. So, um, intended use of the range. I think that's important. I agree. Who is the I agree? Me. Me, Pat. Okay, so Pat, Max, Annie or Andy. Annie, do you want to continue thinking about yeah, that? Yeah, I. I, I. Mm. I'm, I'm not super in favor of having that there, but we're not voting at the moment. Right, I feel good that we're not voting at the moment. Oh, uh, no, I, I was This is something you up. want to keep in here. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry, Andy, what are your thoughts about intent? Uh, I'm on the fence on that one. Can okay. I think more about it? That's fine. And expected days of the week and hours to be used. Annie? Sorry for squeaking. <laughs> <laughs> I think that um, <clears throat> these, these are going to be public record, right? Mm -hmm. I think 
that's a little awkward. Like Patrick said, we have a, a, an ordinance already. I do think that living next door to someone that's four hours and is loud and is whatever, uh, I, you got a neighbor whose dog is barking incessantly, like, I, I don't know. I, I, I fear that if that's part of it, that people will be mad if you're doing it outside of those. Like, I don't mind that we're asking it. I think it's fine that we're asking it out of, like, well, what do you think you're gonna be doing with it? But, but if it's not outside the laws, then I don't want people to be like, hey, it says right here, you're only gonna use it. But I do understand why we'd ask it. Okay. So I'm stuck with the squeak. What do you think about that one? Um, I mean, to be honest, uh, again, I, I don't think it's necessary in there because uh, we do have an ordinance already in place. And it's just, if someone wants to fill this out and just, I mean, they could easily put down, everyone who turns in this form could easily put down from sunrise to sunset seven days a week just to avoid misrepresenting themselves on the form. Okay. Um, you know, restricting it or which, this clearly isn't meant to do, but I think that with ordinances already in place, it's just uh, another unnecessary part of the form. Okay. Max? I'd say uh, we don't need it. We have the ordinance out there for that says uh, what hunting, you know, discharge of firearms can be. I think we'll just, we're okay by going with that. Andy? It's, it plays into this 2006 question again as to historical usage and mm -hmm. depends on how important we think that date is and knowing what hap happened before and after that date. Right. So you want to think about it a little more? Okay. Yeah. Or ask more questions about it. Okay. I think if you go with it without it on this version, we can see how much of an issue that two, May 22nd, 2006 issue is and there may need to be a form, you know, one dot Two or something. Right. This is this is the first pass. Right. As a first pass. I think we can do without it. Um, okay. How about the site plan requirements? Any issues, questions, changes you want to recommend to staff on this section? I'd like to add a section on terrain. Just indicate what you have on your property. <coughs> yeah. I'm struggling with how we're going to use it because you know I think. If, if we're trying to avoid all liability, we're just going to say, is the form complete or not? And um, I know, I, I fully understand that it, it's, it seems like it should be good information to have, but if nobody's going to make a judgment call based on what's on that map, then what's, what's, the, what's the sense? But I thought we were discussing the possibility of either a citizen group determining right, the same Right, that, I mean, that if, if that's the path we go, then there's maybe somebody who's going to look at it, okay. but. Um, so you're okay with this I, as long as there's someone vetting it? No, I'm not okay, I'm, I'm, I'm okay with it as long as it doesn't give it, attach any liability to the town. Okay. Unless we're willing to take that liability on. Okay. Max or Andy or, or um, Pat or Annie on the site plan requirements? Uh, I mean, I feel that that does go towards public safety, knowing what it looks like, you know, where it's facing, um, you know, is just relevant information to have if that's our goal here, which I think it is. Okay. Max. Yeah, I think you could find a red flag. If you saw that there's a house here, the shooting range here, and another house over here that's getting in line of the cone of fire, that's something you'd want to see. Okay. Um, even if we don't use all that information right away, you may want to be able to go back and reference it. So I think it's important. Annie? <clears throat> was it Eric Bailey? Like, I'm, I'm, I'm hearing, Eric Bailey was in the orange shirt. I'm hearing the gentleman describe what he's shooting into it. Like, if nothing else, this conversation helps those of us that don't do this understand what that looks like and what's safe and what isn't. Um, so, yeah, I, I would like to know the, the terrain and stuff if for no other reason than I can appreciate the safety that my neighbor is using for what they're doing. 
Did I answer the question or am I somewhere else? You did. I got a lot going on up here. <laughs> you did answer the question. Okay. Um, homeowners insurance. Pat, you already want some more information. Anybody else want more information about this item? Or do you feel strongly either way? I, I think it would be good to know, understand what the, the cost would be. Okay. Cost to the homeowner. Yeah. Okay. Assuming we get that information, how do we feel about having this requirement on this form? Okay, so that's a question that we'll have answered at the next meeting. Yeah, well, I don't want it to be a, a deter or an inhibitor for people to be able to use the property the way that yeah. they've been using it. So, uh, yeah, I got to think about that one. Okay. Are, are there any other activities that people do on their private property that this town requires them to have insurance for? Trampolines, aren't you? Trampolines. Plus insurance costs. The, the town, does the town insurance require that? Uh, or you, that's a good point. It's I don't insurance. Think we do. <laughs> Mortgage companies require that kind of stuff. I, th I think I think liability coverage is a personal decision. Okay. That's what I think. Okay. Annie? It's not on this topic. Okay. Then please hold I mean, it's on this topic. Oh. That specific piece um, of it. Okay. The only other questions I have for the, for the group are, um, did we, is the sense of the board that we want a biannual process? You wanted, you wanted annual. No, no, no you wanted one and done. Yes. Biannual. Some, some type of uh, frequency because, again, the community is not static. It's growing. Um, and if there is a change in development that might impact that, then I think we'd want to make sure those get updated. Okay. So. Annie or Pat? Actually, kind of like the middle ground idea, the full submission form, and then every two years, if there have been no changes, just an affidavit saying. Oh, okay. There have been no relevant changes. Okay, and I'm, I lean towards the the two year aff and the affidavit approach myself. Okay, and staff is going to make a recommendation as to is a date for this, Annie. If we're doing this in this way, and maybe this already got said, um, if you're selling your home, so w I, I think that we need to be notified of change of hands because I wanna know mm. that the next person is gonna, I, I, I'm not, right, I, I, I feel strongly that whose hands it's in next, if, if that's what we're looking at for safe usage, also, that that is part of the transaction. So that, that's a good question, Greg or Evan, regarding um, property changing hands when someone comes to the town office to get a deed or, or a parcel map. Is this information that would go along with that? Or is it transferred to the new owner? So it depends where we store it. If it goes into the, if it's filed in the land records, it would turn up in a, um, property search, if it's just listed and contained like a dog license or a liquor license, uh, it wouldn't, would not be there. So if it's kept I, in the I clerk's think office. If it's kept mm -hmm. in the clerk's office, if you end up doing that. I'd also no, think if a it's, homeowner it's wants to, homeowner wants to, or new homeowner wants to purchase a property and continue a range, mm -hmm. I would think that they should be asked to Do their submit form. their own form. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. okay. Again, if it's not part of the deed, the clerk won't have any documentation okay all right and the last part I want to get the sense of the board on is the signature of the board members uh, I am not in favor of having that on this form um, yeah I mean it, what do the signatures imply right if, if the application is coming in the clerk or her designate receives the application, confirms that it's complete, it goes on file. If a dog license comes in, we don't sign off on those. We sign off on liquor licenses because those are state mandated and we're serving as the Board of Liquor Control and we have to do that. But this is not, in that respect, it's not the same as liquor licenses. I, I'm concerned about liability for people who are just lay people who do not use weapons and don't know. 
So, um, but if we have this committee that you're talking about, somebody's going to tell us. It's gonna, somebody's going to have to approve this thing, right? right? And I think if somebody has to approve it, it needs to be the select board. I think the select board could sign off on that set of standards or guidelines that the committee comes up with. I'm saying that they don't need to sign every single application. But you're, it's six in one, half a dozen in the other at the moment. It depends on which so. way things go. Yeah. I, th I think we have some general questions about liability that would, yeah. we should pose to our attorney just to make ourselves, ourselves feel better. All right. This, Andy. So something that's not on the form that I mentioned earlier that I think if we do this, we really want to uh, add all of the, these locations to E911. I don't know. Do we need to have... Do we need to ask permission from the property owner to add them to, nine, to E911? Does that need, should that be a checkbox or something? Um, um, I don't know. I don't know yeah. how. Well, this earlier this afternoon, Greg, you sent us a response from Shannon about how, how it works. And is that, some, is that a permission-based thing that we need to have on this form? or? I'd have to ask Shannon some more about that. I'm not sure specifically if it's an opt-in or opt-out. that we have a clear path to get everything, get, to get that, if we're going to collect this information, put it in the E911 so that it's all ranges are equally, easily lo locatable by emergency staff. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, board. Okay. Does anybody have any further questions, comments, or recommendations? Good. Okay. I will withhold all the ones I have right now. <laughs> are they relevant to what we're doing right now, Andy? No, I was joking. Oh, okay. Um, Greg and Evan, do you have what you need to proceed with a, a final amended draft of the ordinance and the form? I think so. Okay. Thank you for your patience while we went through it line by line. I know that's a challenge to sit and listen to. Um, all right. That's going to uh, be the end of our conversation about the firearms discharge ordinance for the evening. Thank you, members of the audience who stuck through the whole thing. That was a lot, and we appreciate all of your input, and please know that we take this very, very seriously. As you can see, we're deliberating over it. We still have more questions. I'm sure we'll see you all on July 15th. All right, next order of business. Pardon me. Well, we have a consent agenda. We're going to, um, item 5E is appointing volunteers to the Energy Committee. We're going to do that after our executive session along with the other appointments. We have a consent agenda with a number of items on it. Would anyone like to move the, the agenda? I move approval of the consent agenda with select board comments. And would anyone like to second? Second. Okay. Would anybody like to remove anything from the consent agenda to discuss and vote on separately? Okay, so we're gonna keep everything on the agenda. Any comments, questions, or observations about the uh, consent agenda? Yeah, just one. Andy. Um, a, a couple of these involve changes in, in spending. I'm just, just wondering if we should have some sort of discussion with relative to a criteria for you know, what, what goes into consent and what needs to be discussed in open meeting, or, or are we or are we just going to leave it as a, I, mean, I suppose we could, I'd like to have the, I guess, have the discussion about how we m make that determination. Um, well, before before we have that discussion. I don't want to do that now. Right, I'm no. I'm suggesting that at some point we have a discussion about that because, that, and, and, I, and I understand, I've gotten the answers to the, to my, my questions on these two. I know one, one's a, a grant application that isn't really going to, and, uh, and the other is a safety issue. Um, You're hoping that we could, at some future date, have a discussion about whether something, what are the standards that we determine allow something to go on consent? Or, or we could have the discussion to say that I'm, I'm full of baloney and we don't need to have that discussion, right? So, because I understand that, that some judgments have been made by staff and, and right. I, I, I certainly don't appreciate and, and, and respect their judgment, but I, I certainly don't want to call you full of baloney because I don't think that's true. 
I am perfectly content to defer to staff's judgment in terms of putting this on the consent agenda, but what we could do is ask Greg or Evan to talk about whichever items you had questions mm -hmm. about so that we can discuss it in public, so that everyone hears what it is that made it to consent. Okay. Evan. Um, in general, <coughs> items on consent are generally supposed to be non-controversial something you've heard before. Uh, in this particular case, um, in terms of the garage, it's a safety issue. We needed, we've gone out to bid twice. I don't think um, changing it in any way and putting it on the agenda uh, for full discussion was gonna change that discussion. Um, you've already uh, approved us going forward. It's just a matter of the price. We've gone through the procedure. Um, in terms of other things, I think that if it's not substantially different than what we were talking about, you know, you got a hundred thousand dollar project that comes in at 105 or it comes in at 95, somewhere in that range, you know, five, ten thousand dollar range doesn't change it to us, especially when we hear the discussions of what we're trying to do, et cetera. But um, we also knew that tonight we had a very uh, large audience and didn't know how long uh, that was going to go so that's kind of what played into this but normally it would also be in the memo and you have the uh, absolute right to pull an item off the consent and have that discussion it's fine with us whichever way you choose anything else about the consent agenda or nope. um, Pat left the room, but that, that's okay. We have a quorum still. And for the record, we don't think you're full of baloney. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we have a motion to approve the consent agenda and the <coughs> second. All those in favor of approving the consent agenda signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? And Pat was absent. All right, um, the reading file, select board comments. Any additional observations? Annie, do you have anything extra you want to share? You're good? Are you joking? No, no, you had referred earlier to comments you were holding off on, so. No, I have, my head is so full of all the stuff oh. about the, okay. what people said. <laughs> I'm gonna still hold off. Okay. <laughs> um, all right, well, hearing no comments regarding the reading file, the last thing on our agenda is to adjourn into executive session to discuss evaluation of public officials. Do we have executive session language? We do, right here. Wonderful. I move that the select board enter, enter into executive session to discuss the proposed public official appointments in accordance with 1 VSA section 313A3 and to include the unified manager the, and the deputy town manager. It says, and the candidates. Do we want to do that? No, not oh, the candidates. No, that shouldn't be on there, sorry. Unified manager and the deputy manager. Is there a second? Second. All in favor of entering executive session, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? All right. 